day today and uh, probably plus five degrees and it's really wonderful. There's a strong sun, southern wind blowing today but it's a warm wind so I don't feel frozen at all. Uh, one thing I enjoy going out this time of year in spring is to have a look and see what kind of animals are moving around and uh, right now I'm in the middle of a of a moose feeding ground. See, I'm surrounded by young growth pine, and that's what they like to chew on during winter. And uh, here's another indicator of indication of moose. As you can see here, there are a lot of a uh, lot of moose spilling, or so they and tracks all over the place. So that's moose droppings right there. They're reasonably fresh. So if I'm lucky I might see one or two during this trip. They're not that hard to spot really, but you just have to uh, take it easy and, and uh, be mindful of not making too much noise. And, One advantage with all type skis like this is that they're really easy to kick off when necessary. The leather strap just allows you to lift your feet or out of the skis and carry them if you encounter a difficult terrain or, or any other obstacles that are easier to maneuver around while carrying your skis. See that there's a uh, that there's a group of four tracks here, and then there's a group of four tracks here, and uh, they are they are quite a bit of distance from each other. If I, for instance, use my ski pole, for instance, if I use my ski pole as measurement, you can see that the uh, There's quite a bit of leaf there. See? Quite a bit of leaf. And uh, no way a dog would make a leap like that. Uh, not even a wolf could leap like that way, that way when it runs. This is most definitely a lynx. And you can also see that the uh, strides here, stride marks here. Look at it. Yeah. Those would also. Uh, confirm that this is indeed a lynx that's been running here. Yeah. So. But the snow is melting rapidly, but no, it's still good skiing because the snow is compressed and it does freeze during the night because it goes down to minus during the night so 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 you so you the snow really carries you well 
across open fields like this. Also, you get some bit see what tracks animals are made and kind of get a good picture of what kind of animals are moving about in these forests here. And, and that's always interesting now. They also, uh, besides lynx, we also do know that there are wolves and bears that are uh, occasionally seen in this area, but I haven't seen an indication of all bear tracks yet. But bears, they are hibernating and this time of year they're probably uh, 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 woken up, so... So, bears are not in Finland that dangerous, but it's a good idea to not to creep on, creep up upon them, especially this time of year when they wake up and are hungry and 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 and, and I haven't had their morning coffee yet. So, so it always pays to be safe. Yeah, so whenever you come across any resources, you might want to stop and uh, and I want to have something to eat in a short while. For that, I need fire and uh, this birch bark here is is really. Welcome for that addition to whatever I'm. As you can <clears throat> see, there's also a small tinder fungus growing on this birch tree. I'm gonna collect this one as well. You see the, the typical feature of the fungus is that it looks like a horse hoof, and uh, it has this uh, very gray, hard outer shell. And up in, inside, if you can cut through it, you can see that there's a, a yeah, definite light brown surface right there. And this is really good for fire lighting. You know, I'm about to set up my fireplace and uh, I'm coming up into this forest here which you can see it, that it's a managed forest. There's been some uh, cleaning and cutting done here so so I'll find most things I'll need for, to make a fire right here. So that's why I chose to, to, to make my camp here. Quite a hot, big pile of dry trees on top of the before you start you know, setting up the fire. So just put this underneath so you have a good platform for, for the fire to start and it's enough oxygen that way. I want to try something different today, uh, so I brought along my my old fire starting kit. Uh, this is a, a, a type of a, a, a fire starting uh, pouch which is uh, based on models we were, that were in use in this region just maybe in the 1900s latest, the early 1900s. So it's a very practical pouch to be carrying. So you can see that the uh, pouch is uh, contains a fire steel which is oval and it's sewn in at the end of the pouch and within the pouch you have the the, the flint we have some quartzite as well which also wor works instead of flint small piece of quartzite as well as the tinder uh, 
this thing here is made of the same stuff as the as the fungus we found. So this is the well, this is the uh, uh, the, 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 the tinder fungus. A spark and light of fire using this method here. But before I proceed to that, I have to make sure I have some proper dry tinder that will help me get the fire started. So here we have the, the lichen, and underneath we have the sap and the birch bark. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine this into a nice bundle and hopefully we'll get a fire going using this old technique. I also need to prepare the tinder fungus a bit to get the fire going. Luckily it's not at cold today so, so I don't mind doing this extra work. I rather enjoy it. So what I'm doing I just want to scrape up, up this hard surface and make a nice 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 small powdery substance on top of it. So this will catch a spark more easily. on television the first time. <laughs> As you can see, I wasn't cheating. <laughs> see it really see it really has a nice glow on it. Just gonna use I'm not gonna use all of it. Bundle right here. I'm gonna insert a hole in here, it's really getting hot. So if we can manage to do something about it. Make a nice package out of it. And uh, hopefully we'll get fire. The only thing rest is to, left is to blow in it. Got a flame. Just add some more sticks to this fire and uh, oh yeah. Lovely. Just lay it over easy, we don't want to kill the fire. Let it breathe and uh, Carefully. And then, at this point, you might want to put away the gear so you don't lose it. Also look at the gear I brought with me. As you can see, these are a very long pair of skis. These are, uh, as far as I know, these are uh, Finnish Army issue skis uh, from the late 1930s. So, uh, and that's just about all I know of them. I came across them in a, in a second hand store. And, um, these are yeah, quite well worn, but they're still very functional. They're white. 
and very traditional in the sense that they don't have any uh, modern bindings, just these leather straps. The, uh, this is the center part of the ski is where the foot will go and as you can see somebody added a uh, piece of uh, bicycle tire cut piece of bicycle tire on top of it uh, because bicycle tire as it's rubber it doesn't become as slippery as most other materials become uh, when, when it gets uh, snowy and icy. Uh, traditionally people would just use birch bark or, or maybe uh, skin of a hide of an animal instead of this. And here's the leather strap. You see, there's a small slot which is cut straight through the uh, ski, and its leather strap is inserted through that. And it's a very simple design. As you can see, this the uh, shoe. You can see this shoe. This you can actually buy these new even today. There is a manufacturer here in Osobotnia who makes this choose uh, a modern version of it, the rubber sole and uh, you know they're you know they do cost a little bit but, but then again they are very unique and and very practical and I always use them in winter because they, they're a traditional Finnish winter shoe called Piexo Piexo and uh, as you can see there's the strap and the whole idea with this pointy end is that it'll fit underneath straps like this really easily as you can see Keep in mind, because this is a very primitive form of binding, then it's also a very loose binding. So you have to have a certain technique when skiing with this. So it's not not really uh, something uh, you should try the first time. If you ever ever tried skiing before, then you should, should probably not try this method to begin with, because it's a very uh, it, it has some difficulties to it. But but once you get used to it, then 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 you'll be able to ski just about anywhere. One other interesting feature about these shoes is that the strap on this is, is it's made out of wool. It's, it's braided wool and, and wool is important to use because wool has the ability of not freezing up and becoming stiff like leather and other uh, ropes would become stiff if they're, they're, they become wet and freeze. So wool will always remain pliable and it's really uh, it's soft, stretchy and comfortable. So. And when you tie this, your pants on top of your shoes, and this way you'll keep out all the snow, so your foot will remain nice and dry inside the yeah, uh, yeah, the, the ski boot or the shoe. Alright, I think the sausage is cooked. Mm, mm, hot. Mm. Oh, it's really hot. Mm. Good. Yummy. Mm. Mm. Sausages are really easy to just Keep in your refrigerator and just grab a package whenever you're going out. And they're fun too, and easy just to barbie over a open fire. You shouldn't make the things difficult. It's just you know a matter of getting out there and and enjoying the day and uh, having something something to eat and drink while you're doing it. So. Another crucial piece of equipment you need to bring to any day hike is a roll of toilet paper. 
it's really nice and absorbent and, and you can do some quick dishwashing use, using this for instance wash out the uh, cooking pot and then trying to get off most of the stuff before you put it back into the, uh, to the backpack and afterwards you just throw it out of the fire and it'll burn out and not leave a trace so you have to keep it tidy and not make a mess See the uh, pit house is about six meters across, and uh, back in the Bronze Age, it was inhabited by uh, the ancestors of the Sami people, and uh, they wouldn't be living in this house. It was uh, covered up with turf and had a wooden structure, and this was really good good hunting grounds back then because uh, there was uh, the forest reindeers were migrating along this north to south around here along the coast. And the sea would be right now. There's about a 20 kilometers uh, distance to the shoreline, uh, but back then the sea was much closer uh, due to uh, uh, due to the fact that during the last ice age the, there was a huge ice sheet pressing down most of Finland. And once the ice released its grip of the continent, then then the uh, the earth started rising again, just like a, a wet sponge being released and then just rising back to its original shape. It's always fun to come to spots where you have a lot of history that surrounds you and uh, there are a lot of other uh, uh, sites here as well which uh, other than uh, pit houses which, which tell the story of, of how people used to live in this region well before our time and uh, it's really precious to have these remains here. And, uh, as far as I know, these haven't been uh, marked out on any maps, so these haven't been labeled yet. So I guess I have to make sure that we get these uh, on the archaeological inventory here in Finland. So, so they'll be protected in the future as well.